Steve Bishop. I'm the director of the International Studies Institute. Uh, I work mostly with uh, Ian Stewart, who I know a lot of you know. He's the associate director of ISI. Uh, and then uh, Loyola Chastain as well. Uh, but uh, Loyola gets off at about four normally. And she lives in East Mountain, so I told her she could go home. Uh, so she's not here this evening, but she helps a great deal as well. I also wanted to mention some other people who have helped a great deal in a different way, which is that they've supported uh, this lecture series. So we've gotten um, financial support from the Office of Student Affairs here at UNM. We've gotten uh, assistance from a number of different departments around campus. Uh, this is going to be hard to remember them all. Uh, anthropology, English, History, Africana Studies, um, Foreign Languages and Literatures, my own department, I certainly shouldn't forget them. Uh, we are supporting it, of course. Uh, but then we've also gotten help uh, from two other groups that have, that have helped us quite a lot. One, uh, who has given us uh, by far and away the most uh, financial assistance, is the New Mexico Humanities Council, uh, which is an organization in the state that supports a wide variety of humanities-oriented events. Uh, and if you go to their website ever, you, you'll see, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's talks, there's uh, lecture series, of course, there's also just individual talks. Uh, there's film festivals, there's projects that students put on, uh, you know, sometimes as part of their schooling, sometimes not. Uh, they sponsored the album cover uh, presentation that was uh, early in this, this past summer. The other group that has helped us a lot is the World Affairs Delegation, which is a student group uh, on campus, uh, sometimes called uh, Model UN as well. Uh, this is a group uh, that of mostly of students who have interests in uh, international matters, especially in international politics. And I mentioned that last because that's a good transition. Uh, because the person who is going to introduce our speaker is Silva Avgil, who is a recent, just uh, May 2019 graduate of the International Studies Program. And she's now doing her MA work here at uh, New Mexico in the Political Science Department. Uh, and so, uh, not, not, she didn't just do the major, she did you know, a study abroad experience, of course, as all international students are, study students are required to do. Uh, she went to Germany, France, and Belgium. Uh, and I'm going to leave it to her to introduce our speaker now. So prior to joining UNM Law Faculty in 1995, Jennifer Moore worked for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, first as an Associate Protection Officer in West Africa, and then as a Legal Officer in Washington, D.C. There she conducted trainings on refugee law for governmental officials, immigrant advocates, and other audiences to follow. Her interests in refugees began when she was a student and at Empress College, just like us, and when she graduated, she worked as a research assistant for the refugee policy groups. During law school at Harvard, she conducted a field research on protection of Salvadorian refugees in Honduras and provided assistance to refugee camps administered by the UNHCR. Professor Moore continues to work on projects by the UNHCR. Her cooperative work in Croatia, helping the War Torn Societies Project, helped determine if the climate was right for the projects and, and helped uh, in post-conflict reconstruction. She co-authored the first law school casebook on refugees called um, Refugee Law and Policy. Being awarded a Fulbright Scholarship, Professor Moore spent time in Tanzania teaching international law at a university as well as facilitating human rights workshops for Burundian refugees in camps. Professor Moore authored The Humanitarian Law in Action Within Africa, where she explores various ways in which humanitarian human rights laws serve as tools of conflict resolution and transitional justice in countries emerging from civil wars. The book involves her field research in Uganda, Burundi, and Sierra Leone. It was published by the Oxford University Press in 2012. She's currently working on a second manuscript called Women's Work, Building Peace and Justice in Post-Conflict Communities in Northern Uganda and Sierra Leone, focusing on women engagement in peace-building activities no more than a decade since peace agreements were negotiated, ending civil wars in the country. 
with Professor Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Sila. And thanks to Prof. Steve Bishop and Ian Stewart for inviting me. We've done some great um, collaboration over the years and, and speaking in each other's classes, and I really appreciate the cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, so I have no audiovisual um, aids, so it's very good that we have what I called when I um, gave a presentation in, in Dr. Stewart's class, my Luddite um, PowerPoint, which is these um, four panels, and I'll sort of just use that. I, I don't have um, photos of, of the women's groups that I engaged with to show you all, but I do have a photo book, and just, it's very old school, but I'll just send it around, because um, one of the um, things that I'll just start with is, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a, as a lawyer. I focus on international law. I look at treaties and how treaties can be powerful tools of human rights protection. And my earlier work has been sort of more typical legal work, analyzing um, the accountability of states under international law and all that stuff. And this book is very different that I'm working on now called Women's Work, um, Building Peace and Justice um, in these war-affected communities in two countries, Sierra Leone and, and Uganda, in fact, the northern part of Uganda. And to write this book, I, what I wanted to do was to really translate global concepts of peace and justice, legal concepts, Western concepts, in, have those concepts be transformed by women, non-elite women, uneducated formally women, but very, very vibrant, um, politically aware, savvy, economically active women how, who lived through the wars in their country to sort of ask them how they look at notions of peace and justice. And so the work involves a lot of interviewing, qualitative research, interviewing with women's groups in their very communities. So I'm going to focus on northern Uganda, but just to give you that perspective that the purpose of the book is really to see if there are certain common threads um, between the two countries in terms of the way that women who survived the war and now are trying to survive the peace um, can teach each other, but also can teach women and men in other, parts, in other parts of the world. And so I guess just sort of starting with the punchline in case I don't get uh, you know, to, the, to the end by the, by the end of the, the 30 or 35 minutes, um, the, I would just say that women in northern Uganda who lived through the, the rebel war, the Lord's Resistance Army War, you know, which lasted for 22 years from 1996 until 2008, are much more concerned with dealing with physical violence in their lives today, domestic violence, violence in the community, and structural violence in the form of poverty and the fact that they have trouble feeding their kids and educating their children and providing for their families then they are fixated on looking back to the violence that occurred during the LRA war and insisting on individual penal accountability for individual war criminals. And so, so where I, I start, I think, is just to acknowledge, maybe just talk a little bit about the LRA war itself. How many people here know a little bit about the, the civil war in northern Uganda? So some do and some don't. Um, in, not to go into in really in depth into the history, but um, Uganda was a protectorate of, of Britain from 1894 until independence in 1962. And the British favored the southern tribes over the northern tribes. They, they, they favored the Baganda people over the Acholi and other northern tribes of northern Uganda. And that historical inequality, that um, regional caste system whereby Baganda folks were used as administrators and were able to go to school and get higher education, et cetera. And Acholi and other tribes of the north were largely relegated if they wanted social mobility to jobs in the military. And so that, that inequality between regions of the country played out throughout the colonial period and then after independence. And so if you look at Uganda today, the infrastructure in the north where the war happened 
is way more limited than in the central and southern and western regions, the, whether it's roads or bridges or health care systems or education. It's, it's um, much far behind the, the central part of the country. And some people even think of Uganda as being two countries, the north as being a, a least developed country and Uganda as a whole as being a, a developing country that's sort of more in the middle tier. And so that regional inequality in many ways fed the LRA war, you know, just to sort of simplify a little bit. So the LRA is the Lord's Resistance Army, which was a rebel movement that grew up in, that rose up in the northern part of the country right after Yoweri Museveni came to power militarily and overthrew Obote's regime. And the LRA um, was fighting Museveni's army steadily from 1986 all the way to the peace accords in 2006 to 2008. And the, the, the LRA is, is a, was a military movement that took up the banner of Acholi nationalism and, and recognizing the historical repression of the Acholi was designed as a kind of a liberation movement to seek greater equality and economic opportunities for, for the Acholi period, Acholi people. What happened is that un in an unexpected manner, the LRA thought that the people of northern Uganda would join the cause and would volunteer to serve in the rebel army. But instead, the LRA didn't get that kind of military support and resorted to conscripting children, and, and especially children, because they were so vulnerable, and um, conscripting boys and girls for for serving um, as soldiers, but also porters and cooks and, and, and conjugal slaves, forced wives for LRA um, commanders. And so the, the dominant narrative of the LRA war is that when Museveni fought a counterinsurgency war to put down the Lord's Resistance Army, that it was largely acting to stop the depredations of the LRA against the, its own people, to stop the child conscriptions and the massacres and all the rest. That's the dominant narrative. And it is true that the LRA conscripted 30,000 kids that th attacked communities and massacred civilians and thousands of civilians were killed by the LRA. But the counter-narrative that is told by war-affected communities and women who are very active in those communities is that the National Army of Uganda, the Ugandan People's Defense Forces, engaged in its own atrocities, also conscripted people forcibly, and attacked civilians. The main type of dep depredation that was carried out, however, by the Ugandan army, the Ugandan People's Defense Forces, was in forcibly relocating Acholi people into internment camps, supposedly for their protection, but in some ways to control them and to keep them um, from, from being a threat to, to the Ugandan military. And so the, for Acholi civilians living in northern Uganda during those 22 years, they experienced a double um, victimization by the rebel army and by the Ugandan National Army. And although the worst physical violence and conscriptions may have occurred at the hands of the LRA, the experience of living in internment camps for the better part of two decades was extremely traumatizing to the to the culture and to the and to the local communities. They were sometimes not able to have their basic needs met in these camps in terms of food and medicine. But even when their material needs were basically met, they were unable to carry on their livelihoods in agriculture and in commerce that they were accustomed to. And so it was a kind of forced dependence um, treating them as a childlike population, but also the feeling that they were be tr being treated as the enemy, as the community that had incubated a very vicious rebel movement 
and who was in some ways semi-combatant, semi-insurgent itself. So when we look at peace and justice coming out of that war, which was the, the, the military um, incursions and the actual shooting war ended, you know, 10 plus years ago. But the aftermath of the war is what war-affected people are still dealing with. And so if you think about, you know, physical violence that occurred during the war, like war crimes and attacks on communities and conscription of children, that is over, but other forms of physical violence are um, experienced by women in war-affected communities, namely domestic violence, rape, in, and community violence as well. What's more, um, the structural violence, the poverty that in some ways fed the armed conflict in the first place, is ongoing. And so today, the northern part of Uganda has almost twice the poverty rate as of the country as a whole. And so there is a dangerous situation in the post-conflict northern Uganda that such that violence may be rekindled by the, the failure to address the structural inequalities and the socioeconomic human rights violations that continue to occur in the north. And so when, when we think about justice from the perspective of a trained lawyer like myself who tends to focus on treaties and what, what mechanisms treaties create to enforce human rights and also to enforce accountability against violators of human rights, the, the dominant um, view of justice by international lawyers often focuses on criminal accountability, retributive justice for war criminals. And so the way that we look back at the past is that we focus on assigning blame, punishing individuals, and removing them from their communities. And what I learned in having discussions with women in, um, in women's collectives in communities in, in, in various regions of Acholi land, which is in the north of Uganda, was that they were much less concerned with retributive justice than they were with a broader, even-handed kind of justice that would look at rebel accountability, LRA accountability, as well as accountability on the part of government soldiers. And what has happened in terms of retributive justice for northern Uganda is that the only criminal trials brought in the International Criminal Court or domestically in Uganda have been against LRA commanders. There have been no trials against government commanders or soldiers. So there's a real sense that even if retributive justice has its place, if it's not even handed, it actually does more harm than good in terms of reconciling the community. And so what um, women in particular that I interviewed in, in five communities in Acholi land over, over the past um, three summers, in fact, was that they were more interested in government accountability, and not just of the penal kind, but of the, repar the reparative kind. So the government of Uganda has never acknowledged its own role in wartime atrocities. Neither its, the direct involvement of its soldiers or its failure to protect its civilians from the LRA to begin with, because that's what governments do. They, they create an, a climate where individuals are not abused by non-state agents as well as state agents. The government has never come clean in any kind of re reconciliative symbolic statement or truth and reconciliation commission acknowledging failures to protect Acholi civilians from the violence of the war. And that is, is, is the type of, um, of accountability that is desired for the physical violence and for the war atrocities, an acknowledgment by the government that, um, that it played a role 
in the, in the, in the suffering of the Acholi people and the people of northern Uganda. In terms of, of, of accountability, in terms of the demands of most of the Acholi villagers <coughs> that I interviewed, it's not just that they want a statement of accountability, there's also a need for reparation. And within um, a Choli traditional culture, reconciliation rituals that are used to um, deal with inter-clan killings and so forth involve rights of, of forgiveness between two clans. However, it's very important that the offender or the offender's family acknowledges the harm that was done and also pays some type of material compensation to the surviving kin of the person who was killed or harmed. And so the notion of compensation and reparations is a very, very powerful um, part of accountability that's linked to acknowledgement. And there has been no, um, no major rec reparations either one-off payments to individual war survivors or structural, what might be called structural reparations, programs of health care, programs of education targeted at the communities of the North that were so harmed in the war. And so the, what, what, um, what women in these community development organizations that I interviewed with want is they have a very, very ambitious ask for their government. Acknowledgement of its role in the war, re really re-entering into a new um, relationship with the people that it is their protector and not um, preying on them, discriminating against them, but also some kind of commitment to redistributive justice, to some type of realignment of the way that resources are spent at the national level in all regions, including northern Uganda. And so that's the ask of women peace builders in rural communities. And none of these things have really happened. It, there hasn't been that public acknowledgement, and there have been token reparations, but no major realignment of social services in terms of need in the North. And so the, the punchline of my book is really that the peace and justice that rural women peace builders see in their lives is the peace and justice that they make themselves in their communities through much more modest and yet powerful, powerful interventions that they take part in with their fellow community members, but importantly led by women. So in the, in the context of, of crime and physical violence, women peace builders in in communities in northern Uganda are very focused on basic education around the fact that domestic violence is a crime and that rape and marriage is a crime. And these offenses are criminalized in the code, of, uh, in, in the parliament's laws, but in terms of how they are realized in practice and, and, and what impact they have on behavior, there's a big lag between the, the formal law and the actual effective enjoyment of, um, of protection against that kind of violence. So a big part of what women peace builders do is basic education around the notion that women have physical integrity and it, 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 it is inherently respected by law and it needs to be respected in practice. Um, and in, in some cases, that type of intervention has a preventive effect but there are also referrals by the women's collectives to the police in the, in the, in the district headquarters of their, of their particular region of, of Acholi land. So that's, that's modest progress, but extremely important. In terms of the area of, of sort of attitudes towards women's equality more generally, another area of important work that women peace builders are involved in is, is education on women's inheritance rights. Because under the Constitution of Uganda, women and men have equal right to inherit when, when, the, when the father dies. But in practice, 
the land is often inherited by the oldest son or the sons, and if there's any remaining resources, it goes to the sisters. Similarly, under Ugandan law, when uh, when when a a, marry, a woman who's married to a man, when when her husband dies, she should inherit the property. But in practice, women are often dispossessed when they're widowed, and the property goes to the siblings of the of the departed husband. And so another area of um, intervention and activism by women peace builders is just educating the community about women's inheritance rights and changing the practice on the ground. And then in terms of this gap um, with regard to um, redistributive justice and reparations from the top, basically um, women in rural communities in Acholi land are, um, they're making economy. They are, they are engines of economic vitality. And so this happens in some pretty modest ways through revolving credit, micro funds, micro lending, and you could say micro micro, you know, like 50 cent deposit from every woman who's a member of the collective every two weeks. That's, comp that's you know, bundled and then given to women who are members of the collective on a rotating basis so that they can have money to pay school fees for a child or medicine um, or invest in a small business. So microcredit and then um, co collaborative agriculture where women have their own separate fields but then on a rotational basis go and help an, a fellow um, member of their collective to harvest a particular crop. And so, you know, I. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where I am in terms of time, but I think I'm going to wrap up my um, my formal remarks and just say that that it is very important that we think big in terms of transitional justice and justice after armed conflict, and think about structural changes and think about criminal accountability for those who are, you know, proven to have committed crimes, but those macro changes may be long in coming. And so peace building and justice making after conflict also occurs in communities in very, very modest and yet very, very powerful ways. So I'll just leave it there. <laughs>
some of the education around women's integrity, thinking about women as being partners in marriage and not being in a childlike um, relationship with their husband and even with their older sons, that those kinds of changes in attitude and in um, even just language and dialogue can have and can can lower the level of violence. But it's it the formal structures are there for referring cases to the authorities, but the the resources within those structures is quite limited and people's confidence in them can sometimes be limited. And so that's the negative, but the positive of it is it does encourage um, preventative action and education and conflict resolution that can actually lower the level of violence. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Professor Moore, if I've got my history correct, it seems like the conflict we're talking about has as much to do with the colonial era, the British yeah. indirect rule use of the Buganda against the Acholi. Yes. Yes. I'm wondering, you know, the peacemaking process seems to have as much to do with that as the LRA war. How long a process do you think it, it's, how many generations have to go by before that can sort of reconcile itself? That is a really big one. I mean, I, not to get too much into like sort of a comparative analysis, but in Sierra Leone, every single part of the country was impacted by the war, the civil war that happened at roughly the same period of time. And so all ethnic groups were involved and invested in the peace process. And so there was an opportunity for a, a kind of an inclusive participation in the peace process. And what's so difficult about northern Uganda is that there is still this sense that certain politics line up with certain tribes. And so Museveni, he's not Baganda, um, he's um, Banyankole, but he's of a tribe that is also affiliated and sort of historically and ethnically connected to the large, powerful kingdom of Baganda. And the Acholi still have this feeling of, of a separate country. I, I, when, I was inter, when I was interviewing people for my first book and I, in Kampala and I talked to them about the war, they said we, we, the war didn't impact us. It, it happened in another country, you know, and, and Uganda is not a huge country. It's, you know, 30 million people. But there was that sense that there was so much stratification. And I don't mean to be, um, you know, not, not hopeful, but that, that historical um, legacy of in unequal development and of divide and rule, indirect rule, and favoring one tribe favoring one kingdom, one powerful cluster of, of tribes, that reality is, is very, very hard to, to change without major structural changes. And so that would, have, would, would take real um, devotion of funds um, and trade-offs and money, because this is a developing country, money that would have gone for one thing going to massive socioeconomic development in the north. And so I, I think it might take some type of political change. Museveni has been in power since 1986. And he, he came to power um, militarily. He led the national resistance movement. So he was a, he was a fighter himself. He's a military man. He, he was in power um, in a military government for a full decade. And then in 96 was his first term, and he's now in his fifth term. And there are no term limits, and there are no age limits. And so, you know, we look at Zimbabwe, you know, we have a new era since, since Mugabe died. So when Museveni passes, will that be an opportunity for change and some type of inclusive government? We would hope so. But the historical debts can be very, very powerful. And so I, I think, I mean, I, I had some really difficult experiences when I was interviewing. Uh, I had wonderful experiences, you know, sort of just being amazed by the resilience of people and their willingness to put their government's feet to the fire and when it didn't have any impact, just go on with their lives. 
But I had a translator who grew up in Acholi land. She went to Makerere and got a degree in philosophy, which is, if you knew, it would be like a first generation plus, you know, just with no, no one in her family having even finished primary school. And she had friends and, and uncles who, who put together money for her school fees. And she did fabulous in her exams out of high school and went to Makerere and studied philosophy. And she graduated from Makerere. And she, while she was actually still in school, she would go home and visit her parents in the late 90s. And she would be in a displaced persons camp. That was her holiday, you know, going home to an internment camp and going and getting firewood and water with her sisters at night and being, you know, shot at because they might have been rebels or whatever. And she lived through all that. And when, when the war was over, she got hired by a, a, a nonprofit, a Ugandan nonprofit called Human Rights Focus. And she was going out into communities and, and helping give moral support and training to women that were organizing to do microcredit and collective agriculture and domestic violence prevention and all the rest. And she didn't have enough income from doing that work. And so she had an opportunity to um, get it, get, she was recruited for a job with the Ugandan Human Rights Commission, a government affiliated body. And she had so much experience. She had worked for five years in communities. She, you know, had studied the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she told me about the interview process. And they, she said they had a few token Acholi and they were hiring human rights monitors to work in Acholi land and no Acholi people were selected for that, for, for the position. So, you know, there's that, that, that prejudice and that um, tribalism and that sense of, um, you know, being sort of in an underclass, that's still there. And so, not to say that that is, is going to lead to conflagration, but it does make it challenging to think about how to transcend that type of inequality and I, you know, not, not to make everything about economics, but I think redistributive <clears throat> justice is a really very, very important part of, of peace and justice and human rights. And um, people are very good at surviving. They're very good at being resilient um, and, and surviving through collective means. And life can be rich and sweet and valuable, um, even when people are living on the margins. And that's kind of what I saw. I saw people struggling and thriving, you know, not just surviving, but actually thriving with a great sense of agency. You know, I, I had sort of stream of consciousness, but, you know, I, I would talk sometimes about being a feminist, you know, with, with English-speaking translators of mine who are all a choldy, but I became very, very close to. And I would say, well, are you a feminist? And they said, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not a feminist. I, you know, feminism, that's something you know, from the West. And women are different than men, and we're strong, and we're mothers, and all this. But if you talked about women's inheritance rights, or you talked about women's property rights, or you talked about women's physical integrity rights, they would talk about dismantling patriarchy, essentially. <laughs> you know, the importance of, 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 of fighting misogyny and the devaluing of women and girls and, and dismantling patriarchy. People would even use that term. Women would, but they wouldn't call themselves feminists. So, you know, maybe, maybe feminism is not the whole, you know, using one term is not the most, not the most important thing. So there's, there's joy of agency and struggle and transformation and, and sort of, modest change. But in terms of long-term addressing of the root causes of conflict in Uganda and other parts, you know, many, many parts of the, of, of the world, um, that I think takes micro change, but it also takes structural change and it takes political will and it takes <coughs> political activism to push the government to make those changes. And that, I, I think that can happen. And I think it's it's gonna. It, it will take time, but I think it can happen. So, yes. So my question has to do with a little bit with the ICC mm. and kind of with the South Sudan too. Yes. Uh, my interest comes from is that, like, from the latest that I've seen is that, you know, the Ugandan government was trying to be somewhat accommodating towards Bashir, 
for like the South for all the war crimes and stuff, as far as um, you know the genocide that happened. Um, I mean, I'm the only one in here that can't hear. Can Can you hear me? I can't hear you, and I can't hear him. All right. Thanks yeah. for I, thanks for me hearing aids. No worries. Um, yeah. So just with the ICC and you know. Um, how there's not really that much respect as far as yes. the Ugandan government, which makes sense. But, I mean, I would assume is that with Bashir, I mean, how they would want to give him political asylum. Yes, yes, that it yes. Would uproot all progress. So, so the, the, the question of the International Criminal Court was the question, and, and Uganda's interesting attitude towards the court in light of its, of its permissive attitude towards. President, but former President Bashir of, of, of Sudan's genocide in Darfur, etc. And you know the the irony is that you know in before South Sudan broke off from Sudan, the civil war in Sudan, Museveni had a very very interesting um, exp, you know relationship and to that to that civil war and supported um, John Garang the, the the rebel leader, and so. Um, there's a, real, there's a lot of um, inconsistency and complexity in terms of the politics of international criminal prosecutions. But what's interesting is that Uganda sort of speaks out of both sides of its mouth about the ICC because Uganda referred its own case to the ICC. So the, the, there is a case against five indicted members of the Lord's Resistance Army that was brought to the ICC on the referral of President Museveni. So what's really fascinating about the ICC prosecutions is that Museveni wanted to cook the books in a sense. He wanted there to be investigations of LRA war criminals, but not any investigations or any possible indictments of, of Ugandan People's Defense Forces offenders. And so the ICC case has moved along, um, and the, the prosecutor of the ICC made it clear, now wait a minute, this is an equal, open investigation, we can prosecute anybody, but in fact has only indicted five LRA um, members. So that's Joseph Cogni, the head of the LRA, and then four of his deputies. So of those five, Cogni is on the lam, um, somewhere in Central Africa, maybe in South Sudan. And three of the other um, indictees have died, and Dominic Ongwen is the only one who is in custody and being currently tried. And that um, is an example of limited but still, you know, very powerful retributive justice. And what's fascinating um, about the climate in northern Uganda is that if you ask people, even people who survived atrocities that Dominic Angwin carried out in their region, they say he cannot take all the accountability. The government has to be accountable as well. And what they, what they raise about Dominic Angwin himself is that he was 10 years old when he was forcibly conscripted by the LRA. So, so the ICC prosecutions in the region are complicated, but even in Uganda alone are very complicated because a lot of resources, and it's another reason why maybe we shouldn't put everything into retributive justice, because a lot of millions of dollars have gone into the prosecution of what's turned into one person, and the underlying causes of the conflict haven't, haven't been addressed. And there's this troubling idea about victimizers who are also victims. So it's not that every single person in northern Uganda will say we should have no criminal prosecutions of any LRA members. But there is a, a very strong feeling that because of the child conscriptions and the number of, of commanders who started their career in the LRA at you know preteen age who were who were forced to commit atrocities and then basically were adopted by the LRA as their family because they couldn't return to their families. That's problematic in terms of 
the, um, account, the, the legitimacy of the ICC trials. So. But you raise a very complicated question about the relationship between the two countries, and I've kind of finessed that. But in terms yeah. of, yes, in terms of the ICC prosecutions in Uganda, you know, the, Dom, the Angwin case could fall apart, but I think the, their chances are good that it will be a conviction, and that will be important because, you know, Angwin, you know, he had opportunities to leave the LRA. He was conscripted as a child, but he, he didn't flee. He stayed. He rose in the ranks. He became very privileged as a, as a commanding officer. So people will get some measure of, 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 of a sense of vindication if there's that conviction, but they do not hang their hats on that, on retributive justice as the guarantor of, of peace building and reconciliation after the LRA war. So. Anybody else? Is it over in the sense that you said a lot of the structural violence that caused it is still there? So is there like a chance that it's just going to happen again? You know, I, I'm an optimist, you know, and I don't want to predict that kind of thing. I, I, I think that when I first started doing my research for this book three years ago, I talked to a Ugandan who worked in... Um, in an NGO that was sort of a, a conflict monitoring body that was sort of almost taking the temperature of the chance of conflict. And he said that he was very concerned about issues of access to land and the military and other interests taking over large tracts of land for um, minerals or for timber, et cetera, in Acholi land specifically, as being very problematic for increased um, conflict in the future. But when I talk to people in the past two years, there's not sort of this, you don't get a sense of a clear and present danger, that there's a real war fatigue, 22 years of, of, of displacement, of death, of conscription, of, of trauma. And so in the sense of rebel movements sort of ready in, in, in waiting, I don't think so. But in, in, in terms of long-term chance for rekindling of conflict, if there, if there is no progress on the socioeconomic front, I would say there is a danger. So. I, I, would, I would just point out that you, I, so I'm an optimist too, so I like your answer, but I just wanted to point out something that, that Professor Moore said early on in her talk, which she, she talked about how the women were trying to survive the peace. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's, it's not just when the bullets stop flying that it automatically becomes you know, peaceful in the yes. absence of war and the absence of violence. Uh, it is a more complicated and not so cut and dry uh, process. Well, yes. and didn't you say too, is that like, was where it was somewhat easier, I guess, during that, for the women at least, is that during the actual conflict, even it seems that the peace is just, where there's just so many problems, there's so many just. I actually think that for women now, it's better than during the conflict, because, you know, what's fascinating is that during the war, when, especially for folks that were in displaced persons camps, life was extremely, extremely difficult. So women would be um, not able to do the things they would customarily do for their families. They couldn't get access to fuel. They couldn't get access to water. They were in danger of being shot at in addition to having um, material deprivations. Well, I thought it was really interesting whenever you said that, how they would say, is that, oh, you're only alive when you're protected because of you were a wife, or, you know, because with the LRA. But yes. really they're family was killed, they realized right. children were Absolutely, and they were not there by choice. They were not in their new families by choice. <coughs> so they made the most of it, but then coming home, had to return to their communities. So in terms of sort of, you know, this idea of like surviving the peace, I think that it, it, it's better now for sure in terms of the worst kind of physical violence of armed conflict, there's no doubt. But for, for women, um, the level of domestic violence, some argue, is higher than it was before the war and during the war. And part of that it might be because men return to their communities after being quite privileged in terms of carrying a weapon and having some identity in the, in the military struggle. 
and then come home to trying to make life under very arduous socioeconomic conditions, women picking up the pieces, I mean, this is a terrible essentialist exaggeration, but women picking up the pieces, doing the microcredit stuff, farming, getting food on the table, and there's a certain sense that roles have reversed, and, and domestic violence can sometimes go up in those situations because of the changing gender roles. So changing gender roles can be a good thing, um, de depending on your, per on, on your perspective, and, and the idea of partnership in marriage and all of that is, is one thing, but if there is a sense of dis disempowerment for men without jobs, without socioeconomic Experience, um, opportunities that can actually lead to an increase in the level of domestic violence. So, so that's you know kind of why I started where I did is that women are less concerned with looking backwards at the physical violence that they experienced during the war and more concerned with all the different types of violence. You know, sort of misogyny and 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 and, and sexism and poverty and then just plain old domestic violence and community violence that's not war related, so. Yes, um, the camps in the north, Yes. since the end of the conflict, have the people been permitted to return to their homes and claim their land? Basically, yes. It took a while for people to come back, but as of five years ago, like 80% of the people have, ha had come back. And then when I started my, that's what you read, you know. When I started my research, it, it seemed that everyone had returned. Now, in terms of the carrying capacity of the land and climate change and, you know, desertification, we're not that far from the you know, border with Sudan in northern Uganda. So there's issues about um, the, 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 the productivity of the land. And you do hear some land struggles, again, because of big corporate interests taking, um, you know, engaging in shenanigans in terms of getting title to land. But in the communities I went into, that was not an issue. The issue was whether they simply you know, had enough basic social services, education, health care, and their, their, their yield, their agricultural yield of their lands was fairly good. And so the, some areas had drought, but n not, not, in, not um, extreme. So, um, so that's more of a long-term problem. If there's, if there's more um, progression in this tendency of the military and corporate interests to identify land for mi mineral extraction, that you know, could be a bigger problem. But in terms of folks returning, how they're faring is one thing, but, they, but, but you know, in the high 90% of folks have returned to the communities that they came from, which is, that's a very good thing. That's a, that is a, a really hopeful move. You had a question earlier, do you, do you still have your question? We, no, my um, professor addressed it already. My question was because you said that the British had favored the northern tribes. Well, for favored the central and southern tribes. Mm -hmm. Favored the southern tribes. That in like this concept of justice and like transitional justice, are they also like is a shared responsibility on their part as well to, to act as like a restorative and like redistributive? Because as you said, it's specifically caused by colonialism. So like this conflict is is because of the British influence in um, southern Uganda and northern Uganda. So like are they also liable? Like are there things on their part that they're doing or is it just their own government issues that are now addressing this problem? That is an that's a, a fantastic question because in the same way that you know, the, 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 the south of, of the, the, the government of Uganda blamed the LRA war on the Acholi. Like, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're killing each other um, and made it their problem rather than a, than a problem that, of government accountability. You, you could also say that the world community looks at why, what's wrong with Africa? Why are there all these countries? that can't get it together and people are fighting each other. When the legacy of colonialism and extraction and exploitation and enslavement has, is still being felt. So I, I just think I just honor your question. And that, talk about redistributive justice. 
Talk about an ambitious project of redistributive justice. That's a global redistributive justice um, vision that you're setting out. And I think, I think there's a moral argument as well as a historical argument for wealthy countries paying a form of reparation for, for, for colonialism and, and imperialism and capitalist ex extraction. Um, how do we make that work? I'd be interested in what you, you know, what you think of that. But that, I think you are right on. Re redistributive justice is not in a region. It is not in a country. It is not in a continent. It is global. And it involves um, very, very, very difficult trade-offs that recognize you know, the privilege that we have because of history. So. Here's your honors thesis topic. That is a, I think that's a good. <laughs> we have time for one more question. I'll just. I have two. Can you me on my first one? In your definition or opinion, what is war? Wow. <coughs> what is war? As opposed to what is violence? No, like, so you're considering uh, this as the LRA war. Mm -hmm. So just to me, like, what does that encompass definition wise as into, like, what it is? So two or more organized military fighting forces with weapons and things that explode engaging each other um, killing each other's soldiers blowing up each other's bases and weapons stores it could be armies from different countries an international armed conflict it could be a civil war with an insurgent army and a state army the way we have in northern Uganda. And, or it could be something in between where you have what seems to be a civil war but with important support from other entities including other governments cross border. So I think for me, I mean, I mean, we use the metaphor war for the war on poverty and the war on terror and the war on many things, um, but not using it in that metaphoric sense, which can sometimes, I think, be dangerous to use it that way. I'm using it in the sense of, of um, armed struggle between two organized entities with some disciplinary chain of command. Um, it doesn't have to resemble a, a, a full-blown army. Um, so does that, does that answer your question? That leads to my follow-up question. Yes. So since that's your definition of war, do you think that this war in between these people is actually done because they had the peace talks, or is it still somewhat a continuing? So in the military sense, I think it's not continuing. In the, in the sense of structural violence and inequality and unresolved tensions and suffering, it, it is ongoing. But, the, but, the, but, but as a, as a, as a full-blown shooting war, I think, it, I think it's not going on now. Excellent. Well, so I, I, even though Professor Moore is a runner, I don't think she's going to run away right away. So I would invite you to stick around and, and ask her more questions. Uh, but I, I also want to, well, first let's thank her.